Okay, can I have everyone's attention? We're about to begin here. Um, I'm Lenny Cohen, the Group Technology, Chief Technology Officer from Capgemini. Uh, it's been a crazy week in the city for those of you who have been at Oracle Open World, uh, that small startup that uh, um, it was interesting. I don't know if any of you there, I had to be there to give a keynote on Monday. And this, the main keynote started off by saying, who is the number one chief technology officer in the world today? And choice number one was Larry Ellison. Choice number two was uh, L. Ellison. Choice number three was Larry, I forget his middle initial, J. Ellison. And number four was like L. B. Ellison. So uh, pretty much all the other CTOs in the audience left at that point, so um, including me. Uh, but anyways, uh, welcome tonight. Uh, this is the fourth installment of our What's Now event, and they continue to get more and more exciting. We've got Jane McGonigal with us tonight, so we're very, very excited about that. <laughs> and j just by a quick show of hands, how many people here is this their first What's Now event? Wow. Welcome. That's great. How many uh, second? A few? Third? And the rest of you have no life, basically. <laughs> All right, that's cool. Uh, but anyways, thank you all for coming. We're, we're very, very excited about the program tonight. Uh, a number of my colleagues from Capgemini, as I say every time, are kind of around the room. Some of them have uh, uh, little silver uh, spade lapel pins. That's our logo at Capgemini. But if you do get a chance while you're here, uh, go up and meet one of them and let them explain to you what we do here at the Applied Innovation Exchange, because it's a, it's a great environment. It's a great concept. Uh, and uh, we're doing some great things here, and we'd love, love, love to share them with you. So without any further ado, let me invite my partner in crime up here, Mr. Peter Leiden from reInvent, who uh, will be our host this evening. Pete? Thank you. Thanks, Lanny, and uh, really thanks for creating this awesome space. I mean, this has just been open this year. It's cool, it's interesting, and he is, and they have essentially opened this up to the broader community of innovators here in San Francisco. Uh, and it's also great welcoming all you folks, particularly the new folks, to hear what's now in San Francisco. It's, uh, as he mentioned, it's a relatively new series. And from the beginning, the idea of this series has been, wow, there's no other place on the planet right now that, besides San Francisco to really see so many different fields that are just exploding in innovation. Innovations that are really going to have long-term impacts on what's going on in the country and all over the world. And so what this, the thing is, it's not just one area. It's like, you know, AI, and it's food, it's uh, genetics, it's uh, maker scene, it's gaming. And so what we thought about in this uh, series was take, take each month, go into one of these spaces, one into these areas, and really get some remarkable person that actually has immersed in that space, knows the space, can explain the space, and can actually to push where is the front lip of innovation going, uh, and bring them in to start a conversation. And then the second thing is we were going to do is to bring in a network of folks who are tapped into that world, and over the course of several of these, and more of these throughout the year, we'll cross-fertilize all these networks of innovators across all these different areas, which is why it's interesting to see the show of hands. We're starting to see regulars. We're starting to see people come cross-connect, which is the whole idea of this right now. The other thing about this is it's, it's really an invite-only space so that everybody here is doing something interesting. And that's the whole idea is here. It's not just here to hear Jane, uh, but it's also here to really engage in conversation, whether it's before the event here, after the event, when more food and drink will come out, or uh, engage her after we go through a little bit of her, her talk here. Now, I will say this is we've had a really good run in the last uh, four of them, as you mentioned. But the high bar for these events is that not only do you get a remarkable person laying out something, but laying out something that's fresh, it's new, it's new thinking, it's things that they haven't laid out before. And in fact, last time we had Saul Griffith of Other Lab, who was so fresh with his insights of what he was going to present that he pulled an all night of the night before with his engineering team to pull together all this data on the energy flows of the United States, where it comes from, where it goes, what industries and where it's wasted. And so he was literally, for the first time, looking at this interactive map of data going on right here. So that was about as fresh as it goes. The other kind of high bar is if you do something so new that people, it's almost like news. Uh, and in his case, again, it was an interesting one where uh, Former Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu was there, and there was actually some coverage of this thing because it was like such an interesting kind of laying out these ideas that were for the first time fresh. And the reason that I'm saying that is because I'm setting this high bar because today we really have, are going to hit all the high bars. 
honestly. And I don't want to put too much pressure on Jade. But I will say, uh, first of all, we've got a remarkable, a remarkable person who really gets the space of gaming and social change. Uh, Jane McGonigal, as uh, I will say here, I'll grab her book, her latest book. What, what's cool about Jane is she's a senior researcher at uh, Institute for the Future. She is thinking deeply about this. She's got a PhD in the space. She's an author of a couple books. She's really actually thinks deeply about this space, can analyze it, think it through, understand its implications. She's also created the game, so she understands how to make these things. She's kind of in one foot in each space. Uh, she is about, you know, who can say it better than the back here? I won't read the whole bio, but I will say she has been called one of the top 10 innovators to watch in Business Week, one of the 100 most creative people in business for Fast Company, one of the 50 most important people in the gaming industry from Game Developers Magazine, and her TED Talks on games have been viewed more than 10 million times. Who could say it better? We've got a really remarkable person here. Now, what's happening is she's going to be laying out original new thinking. We are going to see for the first time here her thoughts on what she's been thinking about on Pokemon Go, the implications of that, and the arrival of augmented reality. And she, most of the material is going to be really brand new. Even her husband, Kiyash, here hasn't seen it, which is why he's here. So it's about as fresh out as you can get. And not only that, but I actually I think we also might hit the bar of news. Because what she is actually also going to talk about is her latest project to get out the vote using games. It's the first time it's been talked about publicly in any setting in advance of the launch very shortly here. So, Jane, Hi, come you. on up. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Okay. Wow, thank you guys for coming out tonight. I am very excited because as Peter said, uh, we're here to reveal a new project tonight that we haven't spoken about publicly anywhere. I'm even gonna show you what this new game looks like. Um, which we had to go through all kind of legal hoops to be able to do. And we, we jumped the hoops so we can show you the game, a little bit of the game tonight, uh, or at least what it'll look like. Um, and we're going to go on a journey to that reveal. And so for those of you who um, maybe I've seen you before, we've hung out before, these first few minutes of the talk may sound familiar because I think there might be some people here who've never heard me or know, don't know my work. So we're going we're gonna to build upwards. So, but if, if you hear the first five minutes and you're like, Oh, I totally know this. Uh, hang out for five more minutes and then you'll be totally cool. Um, so I thought I would start tonight by delivering to you some good news. So does that sound good? Would you guys like to hear some good news? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 1.78 billion gamers worldwide. Humanity has recently reached this critical milestone. Now this is 1.78 billion people who spend on average of an hour a day playing video games. Thank you. The rest of you don't look as excited as I was anticipating. Um, but that's okay, I understand. Some people look at this number and they think, with all of the urgent problems we face as a planet, maybe this is too much time and energy to be spending playing video games. And I will concede that people who feel that way, they do have some compelling statistics on their side. For example, the fact that we are currently, right now, spending 1.75 billion minutes a day crushing candy, including the gentleman in the front row, I think, is adding a few minutes right now. I'm just kidding. Uh, so that does seem like a lot of time. And to put that into context, um, that's the equivalent of having a company with 3,645,833 full-time employees doing nothing but playing Candy Crush Saga. <laughs> Uh, that would not only make it the world's largest company, you'd have to combine the four world's uh, largest companies to equal a workforce that we have currently assembled to play this game. So, okay, that, that does seem like a lot. And then you think about games like a uh, Call of Duty franchise. So every year we get another one of these games. And the average player spends 170 hours per year playing just this one game. And that's the equivalent of a month of full-time work. We have tens of millions of people putting a month of full-time work every year into waging these virtual wars. Uh, they play like it's their job. And in fact, every time a new Call of Duty game comes out, <laughs> one in four players call in sick to work. This is a legitimate phenomenon. You, you caught it, the Call of Duty flu. That's right. Uh, this happens uh, every year. So OK, so they play like it's their job. What can help us understand this phenomenon? There's some really good research to shed light on what's going on here. Yeah. I like to look at Gallup's engagement surveys. They're global engagement surveys looking at how engaged people are with various aspects of their lives. 
Uh, the latest survey revealed that 81% of global workers and 72% in the United States are not engaged. For those of you who have never taken the Gallup engagement survey, what this means is that 81% of people worldwide and 72% of people in the United States answer no to questions like, do you feel like there is meaning and purpose to your work? No. Do you feel like you're getting better at something by doing your job? No. Do you feel like you're asked to do the things that you're really good at in the course of your work? No. Do you feel like there are people who care about you at work? No. Are you optimistic for your chances to succeed and advance in your career? No. So that's staggering that 72% of the people in the US say no to those questions. And uh, this problem starts before people even get jobs. If you look at the engagement stats also from Gallup at United States schools, the longer you stay in school, the less engaged you become. It starts off almost 8 out of 10. You ask kids questions like, are you optimistic about your chances for success at school? It starts off with 8 out of 10 saying yes. And you ask some questions like, are there people who care about you at school? And they start by saying yes. And do you feel like you're getting better at something every day? They say yes. And do you feel like uh, what you're learning is like relevant and meaningful to your life? They say yes. But then as you get to middle school, less people say that. And then as they get to high school, uh, most students start saying no to all of those questions. So um, not an encouraging trend line. Um, and then the Pew Research Center also did some interesting global surveys that I think shed light on the gaming phenomenon. 62% of people worldwide and 59% of people in the United States agree with this statement. Success in life is pretty much determined by forces outside of our control. So that is a barrier to engagement. Uh, because if you believe that your own actions are not ultimately responsible for your fate, uh, it can be very discouraging to put your best time and energy and effort into achieving goals that you choose for yourself. So you, you, oh, one more, there's one more terrible thing that's true about uh, most of us. So 54% of US citizens, according to a Pew Research Global Survey last year, 54% of them were not able to name one concrete thing that they could do that day that they felt would make a positive difference in their local community. So when asked, I mean, what can you do to make things better in your community? Half of American citizens can't think of even one thing that they could do within their own abilities, within the resources and time that they have. They couldn't think of anything. Uh, so you add up all of these things, not being engaged at work, not being engaged in school, feeling like we're not in control of our own destiny, feeling like we can't think of a single thing to do to have a positive impact on the world around us, well, then it starts to become a lot clearer why we might see this escalation. Now we're up to 12 billion hours a week playing video games. Uh, because although games may seem like they're not connected to reality and therefore a terrible substitute for engaging work or engaging school or engaging with society, they do fulfill a lot of those engagement needs, those things we crave, the ability to get better at something, the ability to feel like you're a part of a community where people care about you, the ability to do things that you're good at. You can pick a game that really develops your unique skills and strengths. You feel optimistic about your chances for success, and you may start to develop a sense of meaning and purpose around these virtual worlds. So I think that engagement gap explains why we're putting so many hours into video games, and people look at this and they think it's a waste of time. But I do not look at this and think it's a, it's a waste of time. And I want to disabuse us of this notion that it's a waste of time. The fact that we think it's a waste of time, it boils down to something that we learn when we're very young that is wrong. And I want to kind of do a test here. I'm not sure how this is going to go, but we're going to play a little game of opposites. So I'm going to say a word, and then I'll point to you, and you say what the opposite of that word is. And we're going to see how this goes, OK? So uh, OK. Day. Night. Hot. Cold. Cold. Play. Word. Okay, good. So, <laughs> uh, most of us are taught that the opposite of play is work. Um, but I am here to tell you that the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. Now, I'm not the first person to say that. This insight was originally formulated by a psychologist named Brian Sutton Smith. He passed away last year. But before that, he'd been studying the psychology of play for five decades. He started studying play in children and adults in the 1950s, so before we had video games. He's, but he kept studying all the way through. He was at the first International Digital Games Research Association conference uh, talking about play. So he has a very long career of studying it. And towards the end of his career, when he was summing up everything that he'd learned and observed, 
This is one of his, his big, uh, he thought this is one of the most important things he learned. Uh, and you can, you can really sense this out. You know, when he saw people at play, he noticed that they tend to be optimistic about their ability to get better. You learn a new game, you're not very good at it the first time you play, but you, you feel confident that you can improve and, and get better over time. He found that people had access to a wide range of positive emotions like excitement and pride in our achievements and uh, awe and wonder and curiosity and delight. He found that it was easier in a state of play to connect with the people around us, something about the shared rules, the shared attention, the shared goal orientation, that they were able to form social bonds more easily. And if you were to create the opposite of all of these things, what would you have? Uh, well, I should say he also noted that we tend to have more physical energy when we're in state of play, something physiologically energizing about it. So flip all of that, reverse all of that, and you get uh, feeling pessimistic about your abilities to succeed or improve. You lack the physical energy to do even ordinary tasks, let alone challenging ones. You have a hard time connecting with the people around you, um, even people that you care about, and you uh, don't have access reliably to positive emotions. They're just not easy for you. And that, of course, is a perfect description of what it feels like to have clinical depression, right? So he observed this at an intuitive level. Towards the end of his career, five decades of studying play, the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. Um, he didn't know that shortly after he retired, we would be able to use fMRI technology to prove that his intuition was literally true at a neurological level. So literally, at a neurological level, the same two regions of the brain that are hyperactivated, chronically hyperstimulated when we play video games are the same two regions of the brain that over more than a decade of research shows are chronically understimulated when you have clinical depression and even shrink in size that you lose gray matter over time if you have clinical depression. Uh, so this is, I think I might have to click a button to make this play, let's see. Uh, this is fMRI footage from Stanford University. They were the first research lab to figure out how to get a game controller in an uh, MRI machine without blowing it up. Uh, so thank you, Stanford researchers. Um, you guys know how fMRI footage works. The hot areas are where all the blood is flowing in the brain. Um, and they were looking for patterns that were distinctive to gameplay. Not only which regions of the brain seem to be really stimulated, but in what patterns in relationship to the game. Okay, so they found two things. Um, two regions of the brain that activate in a very specific pattern. Let me explain to you what that pattern is. Every time you make a decision in a game, these two parts of the brain fire up. Um, and it, it is not when you win in the game, it's not when something goes well for you in the game, it's not when you get rewards in the game. This is just when you make a decision, when you take an action, when you fire a virtual weapon, when you navigate around a corner. When you make a decision and you're waiting to see what happens next, I swap these candies, are they lining up how I thought they would? In that moment of anticipation, we get two parts of the brain lighting up every time you make a decision. And think, in many games, you might make 20 decisions a minute, you know, constantly swapping tiles, navigating, firing. So this is happening in a really uh, extremely repetitive and fast manner. Um, so the first is labeled here, the caudate and thalamus. You can see the, the, this side near me is the person playing a video game. The part where it's not lighting up is somebody watching that other person play the game. So just watching the game, seeing the media, listening to it, does not activate the brain in this interesting way. You have to be in charge of the game. You have to be making the decisions. So this, uh, this part of the brain that's associated with rewards and memory lights, uh, rewards and motivation lights up. And uh, this is the same part of the brain associated with addiction. So you may have seen headlines when this research first came out that said things like, uh, video games activate the same region of the brain as cocaine. Ah, scary. Um, but that's because this part of the brain, when it lights up, it makes you very goal-oriented. And the more blood is flowing to this region of the brain, the more focused you are on the goal, the more energy and effort you'll put towards it, the less distracted you get, the less likely you are to give up if things are difficult. So if that is getting hyperactivated by a substance and, and now you will do whatever it takes to get that substance, we consider that a negative addiction. But if you're trying to learn something new, or if you're trying to achieve a goal that's important to you, but you might face a lot of obstacles, seeing the, this part of the brain lit up in this way 
is wonderful because it means you will stay focused, that you're going to keep your goal in mind even as things are difficult. Um, and so this part of the brain is, is firing up. And the reason why it's firing up is because it's anticipating success, right? You did something, you think it might have worked, now you're going to find out, and the brain gets excited, yay, I might have done something good, and it gets uh, this reward feeling, whether or not you did the thing correctly. So even if you fail, you're still getting this hit, you're still getting this dopamine hit. The other part of the brain that lights up in this consistent pattern every time you make a decision is the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain associated with learning and memory. When this part of the brain is getting a lot of blood flow, it kind of sends you into learning overdrive. Uh, when your brain perceives an opportunity to learn something that will help it perform better in the future, it goes into this kind of information, absorb and process overdrive. It's like taking a power up uh, in Super Mario, suddenly you are able to process more information, you're able to process it more quickly and use it in real time to make better decisions. This is your brain's sort of evolutionary way of getting better at things that are important for your survival. And whenever you are in a context that the brain perceives there is an opportunity to get information that will be helpful to you in the future, this part of the brain fires up. Now video games are a context that the brain gets very excited about from a learning perspective because Video games, if you fail, you get to try again. This is an environment where all the feedback you get can be used in the future without penalty for you to try again. So every time you make a decision or take an action, this part of the brain fires up because it says, hey, whether or not this was the right thing to do, you're gonna get some feedback now. I'm gonna take that feedback, I'm gonna absorb it, process it, and the next time you're gonna get better. So um, these two parts of the brain are as I said, the same two parts of the brain that are chronically understimulated when you're clinically depressed, you are unable to get excited about goals or to imagine success or imagine positive outcomes, which is why it feels like you lack the physical energy or the drive to do things that are difficult. And the hippocampus actually shrinks, which makes it much harder to kind of pull yourself out of depression because getting out of depression often involves learning new skills, new ways of thinking, making decisions in your life to do things differently. And when the hippocampus is shut down, it actually does make it harder for you to learn or change your behavior. Um, so these two parts of the brain are getting chronically stimulated when we play video games. Uh, this is the best explanation for why so many people with depression seem to self-medicate with video games. Um, that's a different talk, uh, but it's, it's, it's one that, uh, it's, it's, it is a fighting talk. Um, but this is why I refer to people who spend, you know, at least a few hours a week playing video games as super empowered, hopeful individuals because they are firing up this kind of chronic neurochemistry of people who are gonna stay engaged with tough goals even when things are difficult. And it's not a kind of stupid, dumb, stubborn perseverance because when the hippocampus is fired up, you are able to learn faster, you are able to improve. So it actually makes sense for you to hang in there for a little bit longer because you are more likely to get better and improve. Okay, so that's the neurochemistry. Um, you can also just look at gamers and see what I'm talking about happening. So I'll just show you um, this wonderful portrait series of gamers by Phil Toldano, whose newest work is actually in the New York Times interactive section right now. Um, this, the artist I'm about to show you his photos, they're in the New York Times right now. So Phil Toldano is his name. You can see his new work, which is also exciting. Um, but he took some photos of gamers to try to capture that emotional experience. Um, it's a little bit subtle. So as I show you, look, look really closely and see if you can see any signs at all of this kind of extreme motivation or resilience. Okay, there we go. Um, so not at all subtle, as you can see. Um, I like these photos because, again, that idea that the opposite of play is work, these photos definitely show that that's not true, right? When we were playing, we were often working very hard. Um, we're losing track of time and space, but we're totally focused and aware. Um, this guy is my favorite because, um, you know, I think if you didn't know he was playing a game, like you might be a little worried about him. Um, <laughs> and the pupils are dilated, the nostrils are flared. Um, but when you have this super empowered, hopeful mindset going, you've got the brain activating in this particular way, uh, you can go from a face like this where, hey, it's probably going to fail, to a face like this where um, I call this the epic win face where you have surprised yourself with what you are capable of achieving. Um, you've, you've actually leveled up your skills enough to do something uh, bigger and better than you thought. Okay, 
So um, one of the things that I spend all my time wondering about, and a lot of my work at the Institute for the Future is focused on this question, is how do we start feeling and acting like super empowered, hopeful individuals in everyday life? And as we confront social issues and global challenges that make us feel small and insignificant and incapable of moving a needle on anything, um, how do we summon that kind of extreme resilience and motivation and ability to connect with others and all these things we feel when we play games. How do we do it in real life context? And I'm happy to say that this summer, we did start to see more of these super empowered, hopeful individual faces in real world context. And I think you know what I'm talking about. We started to see these super empowered, hopeful individuals out in every possible environment you could imagine. Um, they are out there. They are catching their Pokemon. And this has just been the just the beginnings of the leaking of this uh, mindset into real world environments. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the psychology and neuroscience of Pokemon Go and how it's leading to real world behavior change. And this is part of new technology horizons research that we're doing at the Institute for the Future. So a little sneak preview for you guys. We're going to publish it um, in November. So uh, just a quick overview. By the way, how many of you have actually played this game? Please raise your hand so I know if I have to explain it or not. Um, that's pretty low, I would say. Uh, <laughs> even though it was most of you, that's less than I was expecting. Um, for those of you who haven't played, please download this at some point and try it, because uh, you will learn more from this game than any, anything I can think to, to share with you. Um, a refresher for those of you who haven't played, it's an augmented reality game. You hold up your phone wherever you go. These adorable Pokemon monsters pop up. You toss a little ball at them. You collect them. You wander around the streets and see other people collecting them. And then they point, oh, did you see? There was a Vaporeon down there. And you all run down the street together to get it. And it's, it tends to be a pretty social and collaborative game. And then as you walk down the street, there are things on the map, uh, like these pokey stops, where you just walk up to them, tap your screen, and it gives you a shower of wonderful things that will help you catch more Pokemon. It's like the world is covered with things that are there to help you. Um, it's like a dream. You woke up, and suddenly the whole world is uh, just full of riches that are there for you to achieve your goals. OK, um, a little bit about this phenomenon. So um, you may know this. this is the fastest download app in the eight-year history of apps. Not only that, it was actually the fastest growing product in human history. So I just want to put this in perspective. They had 500 million downloads in less than 60 days. They had 100 million active users in less than 30 days. This was literally the fastest growing product in human history. So for no other reason, please take this game seriously. 54% um, of the players have been women worldwide. 46 have been men. Um, so if you had any misconceptions about do women play, do girls play, you can put those aside. Um, this summer, people were using this game for twice as many minutes a day as they were using Facebook on their phones, um, which Facebook has previously been the absolute domination of what we use our phones for. Um, within two, 10 days, I believe it was, they had more daily users in the United States than Twitter. Think about that. Um, more installs than Tinder or Snapchat, two of the hottest mobile apps uh, currently going. They reach more installs than that. Um, in the first month. And uh, more than half of the players are over 25 years old, so it's not just a bunch of kids running around. Well, you would guess with 500 million downloads that they're not all kids. Um, so what does it look like when suddenly 500 million people wake up and they can see things in the world that are magical and they can help each other collect those wonderful things and evolve them into even more wonderful things. What does it look like? I thought I would show you a couple of videos um, of what it looks like. So this is a video uh, from New York City where it's just a normal night, people walking around, um, and then somebody spots a wonderful <laughs> creature. And you realize everyone around you is playing this game, which is like you think you're in New York City and it's just a big crowded city street. But as everybody starts heading, We'll see if we can. Okay, so, okay, you get the idea. Um, by the way, there are no Vaporeans around here tonight. It's all the little Rattatas and Pidgeys, I'm sorry to say. So, um, this video is even better. You take a game like this to a place like Taipei, and you get this effect on an even bigger scale. Uh, and again, I can't see why some people are not excited about the enthusiasm <laughs> for which we're playing games, but I think this is very cool and very exciting. 
Um, because you're literally surrounded by people who are in on the secret. And you know, you didn't even know. OK. So um, and you, Kiyosh, you know what that, which, what, which creature was that? You don't know? Uh, you haven't seen that one before? Oh, I've been working in secret behind my husband's back. It's very exciting. OK. So um, what is it about this game that's been so transformative? I'm a game designer. And I thought I would just share with you three of the game design decisions that Niantic, this amazing company that's made this wonderful thing, they made, they, they made three decisions that made this game different from other games that we've seen. Um, and I think really led to its mass popularity. The first is that there are on-demand chances to succeed. So you know when you go into World of Warcraft, for example, and you wander around, and everyone you meet has a quest to give you, and everywhere you go, there's a new story to learn. And so you just wander around this virtual world and get endless opportunities to achieve a mission and do something cool. This game created that same feeling in the real world. Literally, every street you walk down, every building you go into, is a chance to succeed, to get a mission, to find a creature that you haven't collected yet, uh, or all, to spin all those stops. You can walk down the street and just spin, spin, spin. Every step you take is a chance to succeed. And that's an interesting phenomenon. We've never had a game that brought that feeling that literally at any moment, I can be successful and achieve a goal. I'll wake up, just start achieving goals. That, that has never happened in the real world before. Um, so that's a big deal. They made another decision, which a lot of games do not make. Um, in this game, nothing is truly scarce. Now, some creatures are rarer than others. You have to chase them around the city or around the world. But what's really interesting is that the same creatures can be collected by everyone in the area. So when you saw all those people in Taipei running towards a creature, they're not competing with each other. Literally, everybody who gets within a certain number of feet from that creature can collect it. You can have a million people collect it before it disappears. So instead of being in competition with the people around you, it's like you're all allies, and you're all able to share in the excitement and share in the enthusiasm, which created this amazing social context where people were talking to strangers, talking to the types of people they would never talk to. They're different demographics, different ages, different backgrounds. Um, but suddenly, everybody was an ally. There is a little bit of competition in this game, but I will just share with you one engagement stat, which is that only 4% of players are regularly engaging with the competitive element. You can kind of uh, try to beat up someone else's Pokemon. Only 4% of players are regularly doing that. 96% of players are just trying to improve their own collection and to have the social experience, um, which is also a big deal. Uh, and the third thing that they did that was great is they allow players to go where the action is. And if there is no action, then you can make it. So there's something in this game called a lore model. And you just walk up to any one of these public Pokestops, and you activate a lore, and it draws more Pokemon there. More Pokemon means more players, because the players want to go where the Pokemon are. So if I'm feeling lonely, I want to hang out with some people, I just activate a lure. And suddenly, not only are the monsters coming to me, but the players are coming to me. And if I want to go where people are, I can look at the map and see where the lures are activated. And I know if I see those falling pink leaves, that means I'm going to go find other players, and I'm going to find monsters. This ability to instantly know where the action is, and if there is no action, to create the action, um, really created this sense of abundance. There's a lot of abundance in this game. Um, and so that was a really cool decision. OK. Um, and if I had to get a little bit literary on you about this, I would quote, I forgot a T. Sorry, I just made these slides because you know I'm excited about Pokemon Go. I forgot a T. But the um, American author G.K. Chesterton, who was writing at the turn of the 20th century, he once wrote something that I think explains the Pokemon Go phenomenon. There is one thing which gives radiance to everything. It's the idea of something around the corner, right? If I were like, okay, oh, if I, because I can actually see around the corner, and I was like. And like you'd be like, what is? And you would feel curiosity, and you might feel an inexplicable desire to go around the corner and see what it is. And in that moment, before you look, it could be anything. And so that sense of anticipation and wonder and curiosity really gives you uh, this physical radiance, emotional radiance. And Pokemon Go has done this for the entire planet. Every country where this game is played, and it's played in 100 countries now, there is literally something wonderful around every corner. And so you could have that feeling anywhere you go that you're going to discover something wonderful. Um, and that's pretty cool. OK. Um, so how has this started to impact real world behavior in meaningful ways? You may have seen some headlines um, in the early months of gameplay. 
Pokemon Go's mental health benefits are real. Pokemon Go could help people with depression conquer barriers. You can see that was quoting a professor. These are real scientists and therapists actually saying, yeah, you know what? We think this game is actually helping people. It's not just the players. Um, but players are reporting things like Pokemon Go help me cope with social anxiety. Pokemon Go might actually be helping kids with autism. And just to give you a sense, if you um, were to just do a hashtag search on Pokemon Go and anxiety or depression or autism, you'll find all of these testimonials. Um, it's a little small, so I'll read it to you. Um, Pokemon Go has already been a better treatment for my depression than anything my doctor prescribed or therapist recommended. Um, by the way, I'm not recommending a game as an alternative to those things, and no, nobody's recommending it as an alternative. But I do find it interesting that many people perceive that there's been a bigger uptick in, in their behavior that they wanted to change just from this game. Uh, Pokemon Go, this is actually making me want to leave my room and interact with people finally after years of depression. I love this so much. Real talk, as someone with anxiety and depression, the fact that I've spent most of this weekend outside with friends is unreal. And there were thousands of people saying things like this. It was not an isolated phenomenon. It really caught my attention because they were so thrilled and so surprised at the ease with which they were able to do things that were normally hard for them, the ease with which they were interacting with other people, people with social anxiety or depression who they want to be around others, but then they just withdraw. People were going out more. They were getting out of bed, out of the couch in a way that they did not typically do, even though they wanted to. Um, and uh, what was going on here? So what early research suggests is uh, that basically this game is reverse engineering the brain to remember how to imagine that something good could happen. So some of you may know this, I actually suffered a mild traumatic brain injury seven years ago and my brain uh, was very dysfunctional for a little more than a year and one of the things that I experienced was this reward part of the brain, the cauda thalamus, it basically shut down. Uh, so whenever I thought of a goal I wanted to achieve or an activity that usually made me happy, it wouldn't fire up. And that firing up is what tells our body to get into gear. Hey, yeah, this cool thing could happen or you could be successful, let's do it, let's put energy to it. When that part of the brain doesn't fire up, uh, then you just don't do anything because your brain's like, mm, it's not gonna be worth the effort, we can't be successful, nothing good could ever happen. Um, that can actually lead people to suicidal ideation too. It's, just a, it's, a, it's a, lot of, uh, a lot of bad things that happen when that brain, part of the brain turns off. But Pokemon Go, is the most efficient engineer I've ever seen to teach a brain that has stopped doing that to kind of force it to kickstart it back on because Pokemon Go is the most abundant environment for giving you credible belief that something good can happen at any moment or that you could achieve a goal at any moment because frankly it's really easy to achieve most goals in Pokemon Go. You just have to show up. It just takes the effort of walking out the door and suddenly you're like win, 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 win. Yes. So nothing has been designed and to marry that with real world behavior. I and mean, a lot of people, depression and anxiety are very successful in virtual environments, but it doesn't cross over into real world behavior. So this is very exciting to see a game like Pokemon Go retraining the brain, how to imagine that something good can happen. So now when I imagine getting out of bed, or imagine going outside, or imagine being around other people, my brain now lights up because it has been taught to understand that yes, if you put in a little bit of effort into this game, you are gonna be successful. Um, the other thing that's happening is we're seeing more behavior and actions align with the value of trying to be healthier, or trying to exercise more. So you would have seen headlines like, Pokemon Go, is everyone exercising? It's so addictive, people are getting way more exercise than they're used to. That was actually a really funny article because it was about you know, the dangers of sore muscles because all these people don't exercise, they're suddenly exercising, and it was, uh, it was, it was hilarious anyway. Um, and uh, it was not just people self-reporting this, there were researchers studying it and uh, data geeks analyzing it and collecting data from people who open up their phone data for you know pennies a day. Um, and they found that Pokemon Go is leading to a population level surge in fitness tracker step count. So for people who were already tracking their steps on their phone using an app or a pedometer that was connected to the app, uh, and then they downloaded this game. Over a 30 day period, there was a 62.5% increase in the steps that they were taking. It was an extra 1.5 miles of walking per day was the mean, was the average, uh, not, no, not mean, the mode. That was the most common change 
um, which was the equivalent of 30 more minutes of physical activity per player per day, which as you all know is what we're recommended to do, just walk for 30 minutes a day. Um, that was what was happening with this game. And the engagement data has shown that 90% of people were still playing this game 30 days after they downloaded it, which uh, is insane also. I mean, I think the normal third day engagement is 17% for, for other apps. So 90% 30 days in, um, and people started launching official workouts around it where you like go running and on paths where they have a lot of cool Pokemon. Um, and people started reporting that they were losing weight. Uh, a math friend and I calculated that just based on players who reported that they were trying to lose weight by playing this game, and trying to lose weight was the second most common motivation people gave for playing this game. Number one motivation is spending more time with friends and family. The second motivation was trying to exercise more and lose weight. We calculated that these players, um, and this was the summer when there were only 100 million players, um, were losing 571,000 pounds in the United States every single day. Um, and this guy's, you know, he's talking about his Pokemon diet, he's lost 12 pounds, but you can search social media for, you know, Pokemon Go and diet or losing weight and you'll see a lot of this. Um, what's happening here? Oh, I'm gonna get a little bit geeky on you, um, but this is super exciting, I think. So geek out with me a little bit. Um, a few years ago, there was some really compelling research coming out about exercise. Um, and this was actually a relief to many people who have tried to start exercise habits and it doesn't stick. And they really want to exercise and they want to be healthy and it's a value they have, but for some reason every time they try to do it, they just, it doesn't work and they, they just, they aren't into it. Um, it turns out that some people may be hardwired to hate exercise and it has to do with something called uh, the ventilatory threshold. So when you do any kind of physical activity uh, that is in any way strenuous, walking up some stairs, standing in front of a room, talking and waving your hands for half an hour, um, your body starts to change in terms of the composition of the oxygen it's taking in versus the carbon dioxide that it's producing. And the harder you exercise, the more this shifts. And uh, a person who is exercising a lot can get to 85% uh, shift versus somebody who never works out, there are a 35% shift in the amount of oxygen going down. Um, that's when you sort of cross at this threshold where your brain makes a decision, okay? So um, you can change when your brain makes this decision based on how fit you are, but you cannot, as far as we can tell, change the decision your brain makes. And this is the decision your brain makes. For some people, when they work out and they start taking in less oxygen than they are producing carbon dioxide, their brain says, oh my God, not enough oxygen, stop. Do exercise bad. Uh, knock it off. You start to experience negative emotions. Maybe you start to get an unpleasant feeling in your body. It's, it's probably anxiety. Um, roughly half of people, this is the response their brain has to crossing the ventilatory threshold. And these are people who report that they don't like exercising. And why would you like exercising if every time you really started to break a sweat, your brain said, you're gonna die, stop. So um, <laughs> it is really hard to develop an exercise routine if you are in this category. The other half of people, uh, when their brain gets this ventilatory threshold, they're like, yeah, I'm gonna release some endorphins now. I'm gonna give you a runner's high. You love this. And these are people who do these hard workouts and they leave the gym with more energy and they're glowing and they just get addicted to it and we're gonna run ultra marathons. Um, those people do not have a hard time developing an, addic uh, an addiction to exercise really because uh, their brains just has forked in the other direction. It, it says, you know what, if you're gonna die, let's be happy. And so it says, <laughs> here's all of this uh, endorphins. Um, so, okay, if you were in the camp of people who get the endorphins, then you are able to develop an exercise habit. But if you're in this other camp, uh, it's really hard. What's going on with Pokemon Go? And, and the reason why I'm interested in this is that this is different from what we've seen with wearable devices or trackers where people, um, they're trying to make changes, maybe it's working, maybe it's not. There was a huge number of people, I mean, tens of thousands of people writing on social media about how they could not understand this had changed everything for them. They, say, they were in amazement, they were in awe. I don't get it, I'm exercising, I love it. I hate exercising, but I love it, what was going on? Um, it seems, preliminary analysis would suggest, 
that what's happening is that the abundant rewards of Pokemon Go is basically overriding the perceived cost of exercise. So if you want to exercise when your brain is telling you to stop, what you have to do is fire up the cauti thalamus so hardcore that you're in that state that people who are addicted to substances get into where they're willing to throw their lives away to get the thing they want. You've got to get your brain into that state so that it is not, not panicked enough by exercise to stop. And the incredible abundance of possible rewards and possible opportunities to succeed and every person you pass is a potential friend and ally and every building you pass is gonna give you free resources. This is basically the only thing that I think we have seen in the behavior change space that has over, been able to override this brain's reaction to the Benaltori threshold, so that's pretty cool. Okay, two caveats. Um, this game would not have worked without the intellectual property that it had for two reasons. One's a neurological reason. Uh, for people who grew up with this game, you have pre-existing positive associations. You look at these, they make you happy. You already remember the thrill of collecting and trading and you say, oh, I want that. So that helped a lot. Um, and you also had instant scale and guaranteed community. Um, there was a game just like this made by the same company called Ingress and, and only a few million people played that game. And uh, one of the reasons why it didn't catch on, even though it was this, basically the same, a lot of the same mechanics, was that you lacked this IP to guarantee that other people would value what you've collected. Because truly collecting these monsters, it means more when I can show my husband and be like, oh my god, in fact, like 6.30 in the morning, I just walking down the stairs, oh my god, a Dragonite has spawned in our living room, um, which it is the rarest Pokemon, and it literally was in our living room, and I'm like, what the, it was amazing. It was the best, the best day I've had in years. Um, <laughs> anyway, but that mattered more because I could yell at my husband, get in here, like drop the babies, put them back in the crib. Go, go get your Dragonite. Okay, uh, so the second caveat is that players will habituate. Games have to evolve to continue to work on the brain in the same way. Um, because part of what's important is the hippocampus firing up. The hippocampus only fires up when there's opportunities to learn. This is why we often stop playing games and move on to new games. So you think about a game like tic-tac-toe, we learn that when we're young, no adults willingly play that game because <laughs> there's nothing left to learn uh, once you have figured out the algorithm. So we only play games and enjoy them when we feel like there's something to learn. So, this game uh, is going to have to evolve, or we'll just find another game to play um, that requires us to, to learn and master and get better and improve. Okay, um, the two big things I think it proves, though, is that most of us would rather not escape, that if given a chance and better engagement design, that we will choose reality. I can't tell you how exciting it is to me to see all of these gamers with so much passion and joy for a game that requires them to have face-to-face -face interactions and be out in physical spaces. And I think the promise for augmented reality is very high right now. We're, we're, at this, we're at this space with technology now where we have a lot of excitement around virtual reality and we have a lot of excitement about augmented reality. Um, as a futurist, my money for widespread, saturated, uh, full-on engagement is, is still on augmented reality and I think we're seeing that when people can match engagement with physical real spaces um, that, that that is a desire that we will have many decades to fulfill before we are all um, having headsets on. Uh, and the second thing I think it proves is that we're totally okay with games changing our real world behavior as long as the new behavior matches our values. So there's been a lot of interest in gamification and the use of game design and game psychology to change people's behaviors or to get them more motivated at work or get them to buy things. Um, and a lot of people don't like that and there's a sense that maybe it, it exploits us or manipulates us. But then you see a game like this and people know that they're being manipulated by the game to do things that they don't normally do, but because it aligns with their deeply held values. They do want to get outside and go to parks. They do want to exercise more. They do want to spend more face time with friends and family. Um, then they love it. So we can use games to change behavior, but it has to align with people's values. Okay. Um, so that leads me to uh, this thing that I'm really excited about. Um, and I would challenge all of you to ask yourself the same question that I've been asking myself um, since this game launched which is what would it feel like at work or at school or at home or in places where we often 
lack the uh, ability to imagine good things happening, whether it's a hospital, an aging center, prisons and rehabilitation centers, maybe in our election cycles, in our political process, um, what, would it, what would it look like, what would it feel like if something good could happen at any moment, if there was something wonderful around literally every corner, if every person we passed was a potential ally? Um, I think that is a wonderful design opportunity for all of us. And uh, as I mentioned, this is something that we've been looking at at the Institute for the Future. And uh, I, this URL is very small, iftf.org. But if you want to see the fruits of this work, you should visit iftf.org and learn more about that. Which leads me to uh, the space that I feel is most urgently in need of a Pokemon Go type makeover, um, which is our 2016 presidential election. Um, right around the time that this game launched, that Pokemon Go launched, there was the Brexit vote in the UK. And uh, I was really, what's the word? terrified, uh, motivated by watching what happened with the Brexit vote, which was so many people waking up the next day and saying, I didn't think this could happen. I didn't think my vote mattered. Their, the number one thing Googled was, what is the EU? I'm sure you guys saw that. People hadn't thought it through. And I was terrified that maybe we have that same sense of complacency or that same lack of empowerment or optimism. My vote doesn't matter, so it doesn't really matter who I vote for, so I'm just going to vote for anyone, uh, or not really, not really imagining the consequences of our vote. Um, and, uh, and, and I feel like this election has really high consequences, and the, the, the choices are so different and so extreme in how they might shape our future that I thought it would be nice to have a little more super empowered, hopeful engagement, get more people involved in understanding what's at stake, um, and get more people registered to vote and actually show up to vote. And I just want to give you a little context for this. So um, there are 155 million active video gamers in the United States, people who play video games every week, there are 110 million people who will vote in the presidential election. That's not OK. Um, just ask yourself, you know, which game have most people decided is worth playing and which game isn't? Right? The election is a game. It's a very serious game, but it is a game. And there is a winner. Um, and we could, all of us, be players. Um, but it's of interest that more people think video games are games worth playing than people who think that the election is worth playing. Um, there are 30 million people still in the United States playing Pokemon Go every single day. And there are 30 million people who will cast the votes in the battleground states or the swing states that decide this election. Now, what interests me about this statistic is that anyone can play the first game. Anyone can play Pokemon Go. But how do I get to play the game that's being played in the swing states? Because I live in California. And uh, nothing makes me feel less like a super empowered, hopeful individual than knowing that as a California voter, it really doesn't matter which way I vote in the same way that it matters for people who live in the swing states or the battleground states. So I feel like there are a lot of people like me who want to figure out how to play that other game. I want to play the game that's being played in the swing states. Um, and right now, the best way we know how to do that is to like drive or fly to swing states and canvas and ring doorbells. Um, but this is hard for people to do for practical reasons. Um, and uh, maybe there's a better way to get in that game. Um, luckily for me, shortly after I was walking around in a daze trying to figure out how we could avoid our own Brexit, I got an email from the organization moveon.org and they wanted to know if I would be interested in working on an election game to get out the vote. And as somebody who has been a fan of moveon.org since I uh, moved to Berkeley however many years ago, uh, I said yes and I thought what could we possibly do? Uh, I feel like Everybody's playing Pokemon Go, and it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Maybe we could design an experience for this election cycle that will replicate the wonderful feelings we feel when we play Pokemon Go. OK, um, so here was some of my thinking. Um, what if you could have on-demand chances to succeed? There are uh, how many weeks left before the election? Six? Seven. Seven weeks left. What if literally? Every moment between now and then, I had a chance to do something that would have an impact on this election. Like, I could just wake up, pull out my phone, 
swing a voter, convince them to vote the way I want them to vote. That would, that would, that would feel good, right? So just like catching a Pokemon wherever I go, I'm just going to walk around all day long swinging voters the way I want them to vote. Okay. Um, what if nothing was scarce in this world? Now, there is scarcity in voting. You only have one vote. But what about your social network, right? You have hundreds or thousands of people you're connected to on all of your various social networks. They have hundreds and thousands of votes. Uh, maybe I can help you feel like there's more abundance within your control by helping you figure out how to harness other people's votes. Because not everybody may be planning to vote. Those votes, you could help decide how they're going to vote. They're not even registered. They're not planning to vote. They haven't made up their mind. Maybe you can actually have more than one vote, in effect. Um, and could you go where the action is? And this is the hardest part. How do you find the people in your social network who are either undecided, they are deciding between Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, or they're deciding between one of those candidates and a third party candidate, or they're thinking, I'm just going to sit out this election and not vote, maybe. I don't know if I'm going to vote or not. So how do you find the people who are undecided so that, that, that those are the votes that are up in the air. You could have those votes. You could help determine those votes. Um, and also, how do you find the people in your social network who are registered voters in swing states? I have like more than 5,000 Facebook friends. Many of them I don't remember. Like I look at their names. I don't remember where we met. I certainly don't know where they live. Uh, so maybe some of them are registered in swing states. And I'd like to see them so that I could get them out to vote and help inspire them to maybe vote the way I want them to vote. That would be the magic trick. If I could just tap a button and see every possible person who has a powerful vote in a swing state and doesn't know how they're voting, then I could have a huge impact on the selection. We have made that game. We have created that tool. Um, now, we have not announced the real name of this game yet for reasons that will be obvious when we launch, um, which will be on October 10th. So for now, we are calling it Top Secret Election Game. Um, <laughs> And you can go to topsecretelectiongame.com and um, uh, you will be able to add your email address or your phone number so we will let you know the minute the game is live, um, which we hope will be October 10th. That is, that is our date. Um, and the premise of this game is your social network is full of swing voters. We're going to show you how to find them and influence them. And here is a screenshot of what the game looks like, uh, which I just want to show you because I'm really excited about this. And it kind of gives you a little idea of, uh, of where we're going with this. Um, and uh, I think we'll tell you one more thing about this. <laughs> uh, you can share this on social media, as long as you put the URL topsecretelectiongame.com. Um, and by the way, we're, I'm going to have to start speaking very slowly because I'm going to start using words from the game that we are not going to use because it's secret. Uh, so now I'm going to talk slower so I don't ac accidentally say the real name of the game, um, which I do not want any of you to know until October 10th for very important reasons that will be obvious on October 10th. Um, so uh, this is the URL. And uh, uh, sorry about that font uh, taking up too much room. Um, but I'll tell you, the, 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 this is the message of the game. You have more influence and power in the selection you realize than you realize. You may have only one vote, but your social network is hundreds or even thousands. And regardless of where you live, many of the votes in your social network are in the swing states where this presidential election will be decided. We have built the tool where you tap a button. It will show you everyone you know in every swing state. And we also have a tool for you to find out all the undecided voters in your social network. I was stunned to find that 30% of my uh, followers on Twitter don't know how they're voting yet, which is um, astonishing. All of those are people that I now have a strategy and plan to influence. And the game involves giving you lots of magical resources to make you more effective at persuading people. Um, it, to, have, to vote the way you want them to vote. And uh, I will leave you with two, uh, two favors I would like to ask you. One is do please sign up so we can let you know when the game is live. And please share this. And also visit IFTF.org or follow IFTF on Twitter so that you can learn more about our futures research and the games that we're developing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>